Hi, I'm Dr. Julia Gaines, the director of the MU School of Music. We are delighted to provide you with the opportunity to experience this event by our faculty and students live and online. This service is provided free of charge and all performances are housed on our YouTube channel for a short period of time. These students and faculty work very hard to rehearse and produce these concerts, and I hope you enjoy their efforts. Please consider supporting our students by making a scholarship donation to our Friends of Music at the link below. For an upcoming list of events, see our School of Music webpage at music.missouri.edu under events. Thank you for your support of the MU School of Music. Hello everyone, I'm Stefan Freund, the Artistic Director of the Mizzou International Composers Festival and the founding Whoa, cellist of Global Sound. <laughs> I have the pleasure of introducing guest composer Marcos Balter this evening. Alarm Will Sound has been working with Marcos for a few years and we are really excited to have him here at Mizzou with us. He has written a new piece for Alarm Will Sound entitled Code Switching, which will be premiered Thursday night. It is absolutely fabulous, combining virtuosic runs, funky rhythms, and brilliant orchestration to create a wonderful eight-minute romp. Marcos will also be working on his piece Ligara with the Mizzou New Music Ensemble, which will be performing that piece on Friday night. Marcos has won awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Civitella Ranieri Foundation, the Tanglewood Music Center, and Chamber Music America. His commissions include works for the New York Philharmonic, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the New World Symphony, and the Fromm Foundation. He has served on the faculties of seven universities, including his current position as Fritz Reiner Professor of Musical Composition at Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Marcos Balter. <laughs> that the piece is eight minutes, it's actually 11. So that means that you're having fun. That's great, I like that. Um, let me just start by thanking Mizzou, uh, Andrea and Jack and all the supporting you know, staff uh, of Mizzou New Music for being so welcoming and so accommodating. I know that running an operation like this is a big, big task and I am deeply appreciative. I'm deeply appreciative of the support of Gene and Rex as well. Uh, without that kind of support, new music just cannot exist. So thank you. And thank you to my dear Alamo Sound family for you know, doing what you do. And thanks to the eight resident composers for also being here and sharing your brilliance with us. <laughs> being a true pleasure getting to know you, you know, so if there is anyone here that is intimidated to talk to you is this eight brilliant minds. And how thrilled I am here to share this space with my forever maestra, Tania Leon. Tania. 
even though I never studied with Tanya, Tanya was the person, one of the main people that actually allowed me to imagine what I do possible for someone like me. So Tanya, you have my deepest respect and gratitude forever. All right, so I want to start by introducing you to my family. Um, this is, these are the ladies of my family. Let me show you. So this right here is my great grandmother. This is my great great grandmother. And this is my great 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 grandmother, Lucrecia. And this picture is from uh, 1938, if I'm not mistaken. And Lucrecia, like I'm very lucky to have all this documentation of Lucrecia. Um, and it's not by coincidence, uh, there are several articles in Brazilian newspapers about her because she was the longest surviving slave in Brazil. Uh, and one of the amazing things about her, besides you know, giving uh, Brazilian newspapers all these inside stories about colonial times in Brazil and talks about two different emperors and the transition from an empire to a republic. I don't know how many of you know, but we became a republic in 1888 and we didn't abolish slavery in Brazil until 1889, the very last country in all Americas. Uh, and we also were the, the biggest, in terms of number, importers of slaves from Africa worldwide. Um, so we actually have 10 times the number of slaves that ended up in the US, in Brazil. And it's a very recent history. It's recent enough that I have a picture of those folks. And not only that, but these great aunts that I have here, this one and this one are still alive. Uh, and I know them, and I grew up with them, uh, so the longevity gene continues to, to kick strong. One really cool thing about Lucrecia is that she ended her days, after she was freed, she ended her days in a convent, uh, taken care by um, Roman Catholic priests, um, but she actually ran a secret cadre inside of the church for other former slaves and black Brazilians to meet and practice Umbanda and Candomblé, uh, Afro-Brazilian religions, which were what was a big no-no, you know, during the time. So she knew how to schmooze with the priests, you know, enough to actually get that structure going on for her, and she ran this entire clandestine way of existing and making sure that what was important for her, culturally speaking, was still alive. That is prime code switching. That is like the best code switching that can possibly exist. So with that in mind, I also want to play you a little video of a collaboration, a recent collaboration that might actually corroborate some of these points and complement it with some extra information. So this is from a project that I did with uh, my dear friends from Y Music and two amazing dancers that I've been a fan for a long time, Beauty Jones and Diane McIntyre. When I met Marcos, um, he was introduced to me as Brazilian. And at that time, I was thinking a lot about what the uh, people who work in the contemporary avant-garde, progressive art world, um, most people are not um, people of color. I was trying to find a way to get basic with him. Let's talk as two people who are not white people. Let's talk about where are you from? We talked a lot about where we came from, uh, who we were, and uh, how our our stories were. I was confused. Confused about whether my home was really the Cleveland environment or the New York City environment. When we had our initial conversations, they were not that different um, when I talked to Bill and when I talked to Diane and you know, when we decided that we were going to frame the, 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 the piece around the concept of home. And for him that home had many different layers. It was really interesting how these three very different experiences of these three black artists with completely different histories, you know, and even understanding of what being black is. And this piece is a journey and through the journey, 
We fly. So key together quite beautifully. I heard someone sing. I said, oh, that is
this was a really fun project. I've worked with white music for a long time. I actually met uh, Nadia Sirota, who also produced this documentary um, back in Tanglewood, when I was a fellow in Tanglewood, which is when I met Alan, actually. That's 20 years ago. We're old, we're old. Um, and uh, I've worked with them for a long time. So they got this residency at New York Live Arts, which is also where the Beauty Jones and Arnie Zane company is, is located. And Bill wanted to collaborate with them. And they were like, well, why don't we bring in Marcos? You know, we know how to collaborate with Marcos and maybe we can just sort of like expand the collaborative family. And uh, when uh, they thought of, uh, of doing something with, with me, Bill was like, well, let's bring Diane as well. I've been wanting to do some kind of interesting project with her. And we got in the meeting, you know, for the first time, and we, we hadn't really met each other in person. I, uh, they had no idea who I was, but I obviously knew exactly who they were. Um, and uh, there was this immediate click and this desire to approach collaboration from the most precarious possible way. So we had this weird thought that we would formalize the concept itself, the idea of what the piece was going to be about. I was going to go on and do my collaborative thing with Y Music and put the piece together, which we did. We worked in studio, you know, that was never like me locked inside of a room and then delivering the piece to them, for them. We, we kind of built it together. And then once the piece was ready, we had four nights to present the piece. And what we did was on the first and third night, Bill would present his version that he choreographed and danced. And on the second and the fourth nights, Diane would present their version. They were not allowed to show each other's understanding of the piece to one another. So we created this kind of game for us. So I was the one that was holding the secret because I got to see what they were developing. And I was mesmerized at how similar, in many ways, how connected those things were because we had that sort of um, foundation that we had built for ourselves uh, through talking about music, through dissecting what the piece was going to be about. That to me is the most beautiful way of working. I always tell my students that the biggest mistake that one can make as a composer is to think that it's about yourself and to think that you can exist as a composer on your own and by yourself. It is a communal exercise. Music, by default, is a communal exercise. And the creation of music should be a communal exercise, otherwise you are abusing bodies. You are imposing yourself on bodies you know, in a way that you make them change to be who you are. And given my history, I cannot exist like that. That will be you know, an antithesis of you know, everything that I should have learned through the, 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 the history of my ancestors and through who I am. I also understand that I exist in a field that was not built for me, you know. So I am black, Latin, queer, you know, and, and, and all of those things combined in a form, you know, like I actually just became an American citizen two months ago, Woo! two and a half months ago. Thanks. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm excited, you know, but I, I, I also feel that now I have the freedom to really complain about the things that I think are wrong in this country, you know, so now nobody can tell me to go back home. Um, but the, the, this idea of being many people, of, of, of having this, you know, multidimensional things actually translates to me on the idea of what is a voice? What is a compositional voice? Because in composition, we talk about a lot about like, oh, you gotta create your voice. You have to have that style that like people listen to, and then it's you, and for that, you have to really dedicate your entire life to sound exactly like that. And I'm thinking, I'm all about intersectionality. I'm all about all of these things, you know? Why do I have to choose? Why do I have to actually conform to this idea of form? And my dear esteemed colleague, George Lewis, already said that brilliantly, um, uh, on his article, Avant-Garde in White and Black, you know, that talking about style, talking about genres, is one of the most nefarious ways of creating segregation, of creating divisions that are completely unnecessary. So I don't choose 
I am intentionally chameleonic. And then on top of that, working with people and really being able to embrace this idea of true collaboration, which is very different than cooperation. You know, in collaboration, when, when there is a true collaboration, you are transformed. Everybody involved is transformed. Is what you do with different people always comes through sounding exactly the same, they're cooperating with you. They're not collaborating with you. You know, and I really try as much as I possibly can to collaborate with folks. Um, and because of that, I tend to create long-term relationships. You know, so um, a lot of the folks that I've worked with and I continue to work with are friends, are people that I know on an intimate level, and that is important to me. That's very, very important to me that my music is not disembodied, that it's not this, you know, this sort of a autonomous quasi-entity. And on getting to know people, I get to understand their sonic aura. So when I sit and write, you know, for a Lamo sound, you know, I can think not flute, but I can think Aaron. Who is Aaron? You know, and like really get that personality encapsulated on the gestures that I want to create. The ensemble that I've had the pleasure to work with for the longest time uh, are my dear friends from the International Contemporary Ensemble. So I thought that it would be fitting to perhaps show my last project with them, which is from six years ago. Um, we are, uh, which, which sort of uh, illustrates a lot of the things that are dear to us from this gradation between notation and improvisation, virtuosity and simplicity, and ensemble playing that really feels like a conversation. So this is my violin concerto, uh, played by the International Contemporary Ensemble, conducted by the brilliant Karina Kanelakis. Or I should say it was commissioned by the Lincoln Center for the 75th anniversary of uh, the, Lincoln, the Mostly Mozart Festival, or 50th, one of them. It's in three movements. Thank you. 
Bucket bowling is amazing. I mean, those folks are amazing. I wanted to play this piece today because I bet that my alarm will sound friends are going, ah, wait a second, wait, you know, because those are that like code switching and my violin concerto are definitely sisters. And a lot of the things that I was thinking of back then, you know, having the opportunity to work with you all was an opportunity for me to further develop things and take them into a different way that like reflected our relationship but also kind of reflected where I'm coming from. So if you come to the concert on Thursday, you see, you know, you, you, you hear a certain aura that is very similar to this piece and kind of, you know, be able to identify some of these ideas and where they are now six, seven years uh, later on. Um, I can play something else, but I also want, you know, to be cogent of time and, you know, I, I like those things to not be a lecture on you, you know, that we have an opportunity to talk. So, does anybody have any questions, comments, anything? Don't be shy. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I, your music is so good, you're so great. Thank and, you. And, you know, it's nice to be in the position that you were in yesterday, you know, asking all the questions, now I get to. Exactly, it's your um, turn. But something, something that I really liked about this piece was that, like, it's very unpredictable as far as, like, the rhythmic orientation, when, you know, the, the accent to beats would happen and so forth. And something that makes me think a lot about is, like, the role of the composer as an improviser in slow motion. And I was wondering how you might think of, you know, improvisation in your own practice at any point along the way. Oh yeah, so improvisation has always been very big on what I do. Uh, some pieces I do it a little bit more, and I actually create arenas of improvisation for the performers and some works I do it less because I don't always work with improvisers. And even the improvisers that I work with, they tend to change quite a lot, uh, you know, in like the quality of the improvisations that they do. So I try to tailor as much as I possibly can. One of the, uh, the, the things that I have designed for myself is, well, if you give people enough context, you know, if people are like really good at the instrument, if you give enough context of what you want, you know, if they are, say, like, more oriented towards notation, give them a lot, you know, in that world. And they say, improvise based on that. Like, take that, take that idea and extrapolate, you know, or really be as explicit as you can in what kind of sound you imagine in your head through words. You know, some people are better at just understanding, you know, very, very direct cues. And then for myself, on composing, you know, I, I see a lot of what I do as an act of improvisation that I am freezing at that specific time, you know. So what I decide that is going to be the thing, you know, is the thing that through improvisation, you know, it kind of happens to me. I studied piano from a very early age. Um, I played piano for a long time. For a long time, actually, that was my main source of income. I was a ballet accompanist for ballet and modern dance, and I played for a lot of Suzuki kids as well. Uh, did all the things, played for a lot of singers. Um, I actually got my scholarship as an undergrad student in this country by winning a piano competition, which then I used the money towards composition, which they were furious at me, but it was nothing in the regulations that provide, you know, that, that, that precluded me from doing it. They changed the regulations that year. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but nowadays, actually, when I compose, I, I'm, I'm I don't know why, it just serves me better, serves me well. I'm old school, I like table, pencil, paper, you know, like sometimes now, like to save time, I, you know, go straight to finale with a few things, you know, but there's something about the tactility that actually makes me feel more able to improvise, to mentally improvise, you know. And I think that a lot of experimentation, improvisation, comes from, yes, knowing what you want to do in terms of the direction or the methodology, you know, like the medium, but also being very happy with the accidents that happen along the way, you know, and, and, and thinking of the ways in making those accidents yours. Because they're really not accidents, especially if you are, if you have established the terrain very firmly. So 
The degree in which that happens depends on the nature of the piece. It depends on who I'm speaking with, you know, in terms of the musicians. It depends on several things. But I do believe that improvisation is one of the main facets of the way that I understand what this thing that we're composing is. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you were talking a little about the process of making the wide music collaboration, and you mentioned that you didn't go off and compose, but rather you mostly like created it in the, you know, in the room with them. Yeah. And I'm curious to hear a little more about that process. Yeah, totally. I mean, sometimes it's a wonderful thing, and sometimes, I mean, let me put it this way. Sometimes doing that kind of stuff gives you the material that is like, ah, this is what this piece is, this piece is you know, and let's build it together. And sometimes it's the opposite. You get in a room with people, you try things, and then you're like, no, this, okay. this is not about that. Us, for instance. I was here in Mizzou in January, and all of you were extremely gracious with your time when you were very <laughs> busy doing things. And we tried a bunch of things, which almost none of them <laughs> ended up in this piece. Um, and uh, so, but if, if you weren't for the opportunity to actually get to test those things with all of you, I would never know that that was not my alarm will sound piece. You know, so there is a beauty on doing things in spite of them working or not. You know, I think that the idea of being experimental has nothing to do with the quality of sound of what you do, but it's really being open to the possibility that your plane is not going to work. You know, like uh, the idea of efficiency in music, being efficient with how we create is something that I'm very, you know, I, uh, I, it, it kind of repulses me a little bit. Because what it doesn't allow one to do is to fail. And failing is an essential part of the game. Really allowing yourself, like checking your ego, you know, somewhere and, and being ready to do ideas that you might look at them at the end and be like, ah, that's not great, that doesn't work, you know, is a luxury that actually composers had it for a very, 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 very long time, and it kind of went away in the 20th century, that you are taught that this piece has to be perfect. You have one shot, and if you miss that one shot, that's one gazillion dollars that you, that you missed, you know? And that's the problem with, you know, talking capitalistically about the act of creation, you know? But if we are to do what we want to do in the way that we are supposed to do in order to grow as artists and as individuals, we have to be okay with failing. We have to be okay with changing our minds, right? And changing our minds is actually something that society in general tends to shun people, you know, that do it. I actually think that changing one's mind is the greatest sign of intelligence. People who have one opinion and one opinion only and are completely inflexible, I see them as dumb, you know? And uh, you, know, you are unable to grow. You are unable to actually you know, interact with the world and let the world change you. And I see that as a deficiency, as something problematic. So spending time with people, I just went this way and I'm gonna come back. <laughs> but spending time with people allow you to go into these journeys, you know? how that journey actually materializes in terms of sound or ideas, it all depends. It really depends. You know, like with you folks, for instance, I, I realized that the things that I was doing, you know, that I was, the, the exercises that I was proposing for you guys were a little bit of an ego trip for my part. You know, that it was like, it was my thing. You know, and like you, because you were so amazing, you were getting on board with me. But I was like, but that's not a Lombard sound. You know, like that's not who these people are. And I'm forcing a thing upon them that it's, you know, it might be a part of me, but I'm not including them. So what I did then was to like go back to your recordings of other things with other folks, you know, really think of my interaction with each one of you and listen to you. And when I did that, because I got stuck trying to do the idea that didn't, that didn't work. Uh, that's why the piece was laid. Uh, <laughs> but I, I got majorly stuck. And the moment that I like, really started like, replacing this, idea, this you know, abstract Marcos and Marcos only idea that this amazing collaborative artists were allowing me to experiment with and really think of like, no, let's think of us. Let's, like, let's, let's gel here. The piece came, you know, like immediately. And then it was so easy to do it, you know. And I hope that it feels 
that it's yours in your body. I know it's a hard piece, you know, but I, I hope that it feels like it's your piece. Yeah. I have one question about if you had no restraints at all and you could work with anyone, anywhere, from any time, to collaborate with and create either a piece of music or uh, interdisciplinary work, who would it be? You. Uh, I mean, you folks, and honestly, I'm not saying that to be cute, you know, I, I really, the, 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 the more I do things, the more I want to do things with people that I know, you know, that people, people that I have at least started to build a history, you know, the thing that, like, making it, you know, allows one to work with fancy people, you know, like, I've, I've worked with some fancy people, and, you know, it's all fun and games, you know, but, you lose a lot in that process. You lose quite a lot not knowing the people that you're working with. I mean, you gain, of course, by expanding your circles and hoping that that first awkwardness is going to turn into many other encounters that would allow you to develop you know, a true relationship. But the reality is, you know, given the business aspect of the game, it doesn't most of the time. You know, like with the fancy folks, it's a one-off. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, you did your, X, Y, Z piece, and now you're gonna do your A, B, C piece, you know, and like maybe you'll get played again by some other folks, you know, and that doesn't interest me anymore. I, you know, I, I feel that like in if I put, when I put myself in situations like that, sometimes the environment itself is very hostile, you know, and it's a struggle, it's a battle to actually get to do the things the way that I want to do. Um, I feel like sometimes the awkwardness is combined with a complete lack of time, you know, to actually put things together in the way that they're supposed to do. So it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's you making music that is half-baked with people that you barely know, you know, nobody leaves feeling really, really good, and it's a one-off that just happened for whatever reason. I'm trying to eliminate that from my life as much as I possibly can. And uh, I'm not talking about any kind of ensemble. I'm not talking about, you know, new music ensemble versus orchestra or anything like that. I don't want to give this false impression. But my hope is, you know, to find different homes like I have with Alambo Sound or the International Contemporary Ensemble or Y Music or all the other folks or with specific individuals like Claire Chase, you know, Jay Campbell and, and, and the folks from Jack Quartet that I know, and I want to find an equivalent of that on the choral world or the orchestral world, you know, that people that I build a home. I've never had a residency with any of this on something, maybe that's what I'm missing, you know. Um, so who knows, maybe on operating that level, I, I would get to that point. But I am extremely, ridiculously lucky to know folks like you who are really like, you know, among the best in the world. Why would I, you know, do the whole like meme thing of like looking <laughs> somewhere else when I'm already, you know, with the perfect date by my side? So the answer is you. Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, oh, Daniel, please. Yeah, I, I was kind of curious uh, in your either like in your music stylistically or in your in your process where. You, you locate your Brazilian influence. That's, you know, that's a question that I get quite a lot. <laughs> and I, I will just say that anything, anything that I do is Brazilian. Anything. Any sound. For me to be Brazilian, I just need to breathe. Because I am Brazilian. You know? So this idea of creating an archetype of what Brazilianness is, is something that I try to push away as much as I can. And I know that you're asking me this so I can say that because we've had this conversation before, I think, like a long time ago, you know, but it's, it's, it's very true to me, you know, that like the, the one of the ways in which one can push back, you know, on this idea of um, exoticism, you know, is presenting yourself for who you are. Like Tanya has said something, you know, for the past two days that is very, very true. It's like, where, who, where are you in your music? That I think that your father said that to you, you know? And if you are in your music, your music is who you are. 
If you do the thing that is actually in you if, you, if your music is an extension of your being, there is no way that your music is not going to represent you. If you don't see yourself in your music, that's the problem, right? If you actually don't want to understand what it is, that's the problem. So my music is Brazilian music, my music is queer music, my music is black music, my music is New Yorker, New Yorker music, and you know, maybe even academic music since I teach in academia. You know, it's all of those things because it comes from me. I don't need to create a thing, you know, for that. And the, the whole idea of creating a thing that signifies something else, if you think of it, it's quite militaristic, right? Because if we think of like when that happened in, in, in art, you know, it was doing wars, you know, nationalism, the whole like FDR kind of thing, Aaron Copeland, Villa Lobos, you know, it's very, ballistic, it's very nefarious in that way. You know, it's a presentation of a nation that is supposed to, through culture, build borders. I'm anti-borders. So the way in which I express who I am should suffice in terms of the love of Brazilianness in anything that I do. Yeah. Cool, well, thank you all so much for listening. <laughs>
and, and okay. You ready? Okay, I'll, I'll introduce someone who pos possibly doesn't really need an introduction, so it's a real honor to be standing here and saying that I know you, Tanya, now. It's been three days and it feels like family. Tanya is the warmest, kindest person you know I, I've encountered uh, so far, and it's my pleasure to read to you that she, as you know, is a highly regarded as a composer, conductor, educator, advisor to arts organizations. Uh, her orchestral work, Stride, commissioned by the New York Philharmonic, was awarded the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in Music. And in 2022, she was named a recipient of the 45th Annual Kennedy Center Honors for Lifetime Artistic Achievements. Uh, in 2023, she was awarded the Michael Ludwig Nemers Prize in Music Composition from Northwestern University. And most recently, Leon became the London Philharmonic Orchestra's Next, com next composer in residence, a post you will hold for two seasons, beginning in September of 2023. She will also hold Carnegie Hall's Richard and Barbara Debs Composer's Chair for its 2023-2024 season. And Tania's uh, piece, Toque, is going to be performed by Alarm Will Sound this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. in, Missouri, in the Missouri Theater, back to back with the new arrangement for Alarm Will Sound, Grand Toque, written by John Orff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with whom I also have a very nice conversation today along with Tanya, where Tanya looked him in the eye and tell him, told him, we are family. Aww. But she said it in a way, I got teary, like, and, and she looked at me also, and we're all family. And just Marcus already said it, it's really important to like who you work with. And I feel that all the time. And I know you guys have been feeling it this past week and this week as well. So without further ado, you're in for a treat. Please welcome Tania Leon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to, um, uh, I cannot follow how eloquent Marcos Voucher is, but one of the things that I want to reinforce is the fact that um, it's a privilege to be with all of you, because all of you are a mark of a genius on earth. Everybody is very different, but everybody is actually I don't, a, a mark of what a human being is all about. We don't talk about it, we don't actually, you know, relate. I had the pleasure this morning to, to actually have conversation with two of you. And uh, we, we got there. We got to that point to talk about the inside as, as opposed to the outside. So, I mean, speaking of the inside as opposed to the outside, first of all, I would like to actually thank uh, the Misu Festival, you know, I mean, from the founder to everybody that actually is part of this family. And uh, uh, alarm will sound, you know, I mean, uh, that's something that, uh, I don't know, uh, but Alan and I, we know each other for a long time. And we have been talking about many, many, many projects. And, and finally, you know, besides this, you know, he's involved now in the project with the Carnegie Hall. And, uh, and I'm very happy that I was able to actually bring him along. And, um, and you know, I mean, that, that is what I wanted to say, my, my gratitude for being here and uh, for the opportunity to meet all of you. And uh, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna remember all of you. I mean, that conversation that we have with Peter and I this morning. <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the things that I want to tell you is that um, Marcus talked about his family. And I think that I, uh, my family taught me to be global even when I didn't know that that was gonna to happen to me. Because I also have uh, something that I regret that I don't have is photographs. Um, they, I mean, even myself, there's no photograph of me when I was actually in, as a child because my family didn't have a camera. I come from a very, very, very poor family that, that had sort of like dreams and they started working on something called the Tania Leon Project. So that, that is how actually I am here. 
and it's a family comprised of people of three different cultures, which is uh, the African culture, you know, I mean, the legend is, I call it family legends, they talk about that my grandmother, which actually lived for 104, right? Her mother was born in one of those ships in the Atlantic, because her mother was a slave and she was born in the ship, so she was citizen of nowhere, you see? And then she arrived in Cuba, and her daughter, which is actually my grandmother, um, actually end up having 17 children. And one of those children is my mother. And my mother died only, I mean, she died in 2014, and I had the possibility to bring her to the United States many times. And uh, in her first trip, uh, Arthur Mitchell invited her to go on tour with us. So she was on tour with the Dance Theatre of Harlem. And the night that she arrived, I couldn't pick her up because I was conducting for the Albanelli and somebody brought her and Albanelli had made sure that there was a seat behind me so when I took the bow, my mother would be the person I would see. So, I mean, so some things that are incredible. But my family is comprised of people from Africa, people from Spain, and people from China. So, and that's how I just grew up. And I love, you know, chopsticks, and, you know, I mean, and the whole thing, because everybody was inputting their culture into all of us. And uh, the, ba the main thing that they had in common is that everybody was poor. And, and that was the neighborhood where we were at. So, in order to introduce how this thing happened, I was not supposed to be a, a, a composer. I was studying piano. I started studying piano, you know, when I was four years old. And then, you know, I arrived in the United States as a pianist, thinking that I'm going to be here for a couple of years, make some money, and go to do my dream. Because I told my family I was going to be living in Paris. You see, and I told them that when I was nine years old, and they look at me like I was crazy, you see. So therefore, I'm here because fate, destiny, and, and, and the fact that by the time I arrived in this country, for the tensions between the family, I mean, between the, the country where I was born and the one that adopted me, you know, I end up arriving here with no citizenship. And that's what actually made me to stay here because uh, the uh, government told me that I had to be here for at least five years so I could have a passport. So, and now I am going to give you this introduction which is actually very short and it's an introduction that I had to do, you know, at the induction ceremony of um, the Academy of Arts and Science in Cambridge. And why? Because I want to actually give the credit to the person that really made this happen. Upon my arrival, within the year of my arriving in the United States, for a chance counter, you know, I actually met a man that I didn't know who it was, who he was, but he had a project in mind, and he heard me play the piano, and even that I didn't speak English, he actually took me on board. And this happened just days after he died. So I wanted to actually play this for you before I play my music. So. <laughs> Music to 
me is that son do. By the time I was in my teens, I had a tendency to rearrange every single piece that I would play. Let's assume that I was playing Chopin, and you know, of course, I mean, that was a little bit pretentious, you know, to get a, a rearranged Chopin, in a way. And uh, of course, I wouldn't do that at the conservatory, never done that also in front of my teachers. But at home, I would be doing all, all, all kinds of interpretation, variations of the thing, and, and things like that. And um, they used to be very unconventional. You know, I would be going in one rhythm and turn to another rhythm and then syncopate the, the, the melody. And I mean, so that's how the whole thing began. In Cuba, as I was studying in the conservatory, in terms of the American composers, the only two that I heard were Bernstein and Copeland. It was West Side Story, the first thing that I heard of Leonard Bernstein. And the rhythms and the verb that is spoke about American music was something that attracted me a great deal. Course, but you know that is one of the first photographs, you know, that I did with Arthur Mitchell and Carol Schuch. At that point, I didn't actually speak English, and um, because of uh, the traumatic situation of my arrival, uh, I lost my hair. My hair came out of chunks, you know, because I mean my nerves, and you know, I mean, and and so I was wearing a wig. <laughs> so. But anyway, um, I would like to actually uh, open up uh, to tell you a little bit about the panoramic view of what my music is about, and then you can ask me questions. So I put together some pieces which are jo uh, um, shorter, you know, so we can actually gain time. And then, you know, at the end, if you would like to have any questions, let me know. So the first thing that we are going to actually listen to is um, a pandemic performance. So, and this is Conrad Tao playing a solo piano piece of mine called Ritual. And this happened at Tanglewood. Thank you. 
Um, um, we are going to uh, listen now to a piece called Horizons. It was written for the NDR Orchestra in uh, Hamburg and um, is uh, conducted by uh, Peter Rupsika. Right? Mm -hmm.
can, we can do that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm going to um, play, play for you um, a piece uh, called Alma, Soul, you know, uh, for uh, a social piece. I, you know, I've selected pieces that, you know, um, as I said, I would like to give you a panoramic view of the, the places I inhabit. Um, There's one simple. Oh, oh. <laughs> so no, we're going to actually, um, do we have Alma? Alma? And the interpreter is Maria Martin. Um, it's for flute and piano. <laughs> You have Alma? No, 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 Alma, the next one. That's it.
Do you give me a break? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, why don't we listen to um, perhaps a little bit with uh, the voice? And I did a collaboration with Margaret Atwood. You know, I, you know Margaret Atwood, a poet from uh, Canada. You know, I am not going to play the entire cycle. Um, I have a fascination and a tremendous amount of relationship with poets. So, I mean, working with her, with Jamaica Kinke, and uh, um, uh, Ashbery, you know, I mean, he's, he's not, no longer with us. And uh, people like that, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very fond of poets. And uh, now I'm writing a piece for uh, Claire Chase. And uh, the poet that I'm using is Rita Dove, uh, with whom I have had now a third collaboration. So, I mean, collaborations, you know, they, they, they become your family. So perhaps we could use, um, you know, to actually hear some of the writing for the voice, um, two, two of the selections of the Atwood songs. It's called Atwood songs. And actually she came, she was there uh, for the premiere. And uh, so um, let's listen to uh, the first two. Atwood songs, okay, yeah. And ah, by the way, it's Stephanie Lamprea and Jeremiah Cosa at the piano. <coughs> Thank you. 
so I, um, you, I have done things with uh, electronics. You know, I mean, you can actually go to YouTube. And uh, I wrote a piece uh, for Mari Kimura. You know Mari Kimura, right? And, uh, you know, it was an experiment. And uh, it's a piece uh, uh, with uh, interactive computer, you know, and, um, and uh, it's a long piece. That's why I did it, you know. And, and it's also this one. I mean, we continue with the cycle also. And, um, and I did that. And then uh, another artist, uh, um, um, Yoshioka, Airi. Airi Yoshioka, I don't know if you know Airi. You don't know Airi? Yeah. I mean, she's also a fabulous uh, violinist. And then, I mean, she also uh, requested the same. You know, she wanted her own. And uh, so we, we did that also. And um, so that is something that you can actually go um, to YouTube um, and look for them. And um, there's a piece also that um, has to do with um, my first, my return to Cuba after 12 years of not being able to do so. And uh, it's called Indígena. And it's uh, also, you know, you can actually um, uh, look at the score because, I mean, the score, while it's being played, uh, is on, on YouTube also. So you can see. And that is uh, my first reaction of going back to Cuba. And, and you are going to hear some things that have to do by, with, with my, uh, my roots. So I am going to give you snips of that root and the things that I, all of a sudden, I transform. I mean, I'm, I'm a chameleon in a way, and and whatever happens to me inside, uh, I let it be, and and I, I just write, you know, no 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 judgment. Um, but the, there's it's a short piece for guitar called Bailarín, and you're going to hear for the first time some traces of Latin America in there. Yeah, yeah, Bailarín and. Uh, Actually, is played by Emmanuel Lacopo.
<laughs> We're going to stop this right now. <laughs> right now. Okay, now let me tell you something. And this is something that I am really, really very moved about because this is how I put myself together in a certain way. I was commissioned to write this music for ballet that now is played actually outside of the ballet. It's called Inura. It's a, it's a piece that I, it's about 40 minutes long in eight movements. And this, uh, I was actually assigned to go down to Salvador do Bahia, the, the Bahia in Brazil, you know, and uh, I hang out there with the most incredible musicians and specifically percussionists, and I fell in love with them. And I decided that they would be part of the piece. The thing is that they didn't read music. They were fantastic musicians, but you know, everything is taught uh, by, by trade or by you know, uh, imitation or, or things like that. So what I did is that I decomposed the entire uh, polyrhythmia that I wanted to be underneath of um, a piece for chorus, strings, and, and, and percussion. Five percussionists. So the agreement was that four percussionists will fly to New York. And how did they learn the music? Is that Sibelius. <laughs> I was able to sort of like decompose the whole thing and actually give them exactly what they were to memorize. So when we put it together, it will be a machine, you know? So, I mean, so, I mean, somebody will be pa, 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 and the other one will be or pa, you know? And it's like, but when you put it together, you will hear it. The thing is that they arrived in New York. Also, I used a fifth person, Eric Charleston, that plays with the New York Philharmonic, but he plays with everybody. So, and Eric, had to be there because he's the only person that read the music. So Eric was playing marimba, you know, everything that mallets, that was Eric. And he was in the middle of everybody to make sure, you have no idea what happened when we got together in New York. They knew their parts, but when we put it together, they have never played with a conductor. That's on top, on top of that everything, you see what I mean? And, and I don't know what to do. I had no idea. We put the whole thing together. Everybody look at each other like, mm, <laughs> what's going to happen here? <laughs> you know, the singers were there, the, the, the musicians and the string players, all, the, all these incredible cats that play on Broadway and everything, you know, because I mean, it, it was something that dealt with polyrhythmia. Well, let me tell you something. After four days of rehearsals, we opened up. It was a smash success, and the producer said, we are going to record it before they go back to Brazil, <laughs> you know? And, and it was good for me, you know why? Because I grew up in a conservatory. We were talking about the strict rudiments of the French training, which is all solfege from, 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 from the, from the get-go, you know? And the thing is that also on the weekends, we will hang out in the streets of New York. And you have to understand that most of us, you know, I mean, Leo Brower was ahead of us in age, but I mean, Chucho Valdez, you know, all these people, you know, and, uh, and my, my graduation recital, it was with somebody that you have no idea that I'm gonna mention to you. I mean, it's, it's written in the books, you can read in the books. And the thing is, it was Paquito de Rivera. So Paquito de Rivera and I, he was on clarinet, he graduated on clarinet and me and piano. And of course with Brahms, you know, <laughs> I mean, we played the Brahms, Kabaleski, I mean, all these things. And then at the end, you know, we actually got a tune that I had in mind and we actually did um, a Latin jazz uh, encore. And our teachers, of course, they look at us like this, you know, but the entire, uh, you know, the crowd of the conservatory, they were like, yeah, <laughs> you know. Well, but they, but that's, that's how I grew up. I mean, between all of these uh, people in the streets of Havana that didn't go to the conservatory, but they were fierce. And then us 
and, and this is the first time that I actually put this together with this, this and then another piece that I did called Bate, collaborating with, I mean, Michel Camilo. You know Michel Camilo? Yeah? Right. <laughs> what? Or, he's your hero? Oh, Michel Camilo, I mean, yeah, yeah. We did something dedicated to our um, grandmothers from Africa. It's called Bate. Because in Bate is the, the, in the plantation, the only area where the Africanos could celebrate their birth, their death, their everything, you know, I mean, and that, that piece we did uh, with um, uh, an ensemble of voices and, and percussion. Yeah, but I'm gonna play a little bit, you know, I can play a little bit of Inura. Inura is the one that I just told you, of the ones that came. And when you hear the percussion, all of that is written. The only thing, so in other words, so someone else can play it. But the point is that these people, the four, it was all memorized. And they memorized all of the, the movements. I mean, and I, I'm in love with them. And they gave me their beating bow when they left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have it at home. Yeah. So a little bit of Inura, and then we can do a little bit of Bate.
you, I mean, to get that machine going on, I mean, it, it was something else. And of course, I mean, I couldn't conduct this way. I have to do, 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 do. <laughs> you know, literally dancing. So they, 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 they would keep, you know, the, the stamina and the whole thing. So why don't we play a little bit of bate, you know, because Michelle, yeah? Let's play a little bit of bate. And this is the one that I told you that, uh, that we um, dedicated uh, to our grandmothers.
That's a very long piece. So, I mean, you can find it on, it on YouTube and you can hear it and how it, you know, and then, and then at the end, the last movement, it is, I mean, that is when the polyrhythmia just come like, 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 like a tornado, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you know, and, and uh, but um, those are many of the words that I have it as a, as a musician and, um, all of them are me, and 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 that uh, still trying to find out where I am in my music, which is what my father told me. So, questions? Yeah. There is an image of you with Max Roach. Yeah. What, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was a concerto uh, that I was conducting. You know, because uh, I did a project in, in, in New York uh, called the uh, Community Concert Series for the um, uh, Brooklyn Philharmonia. And that uh, an opportunity that was given to us, I said us because it was Talib Hakim, Julius Eastman and myself. And, uh, and it was given to us by Lucas Foss. And Lucas actually uh, sort of like enthusiastically talked to us about doing something with contemporary music and taking the orchestra to the streets of New York. And we started, the first series was dedicated to black uh, composers. And it's interesting because, I mean, we did all kinds of things with composers of all walks of life. And to this day, I remember now, um, you know, I mean, our, my archives went to Columbia University, by the way, and uh, they are going to start uh, actually unveiling all those pictures because one of the concerts that we did was with UB Blake when he was almost 99 years old. And, uh, and all of these people that now are no longer with us, you know, like Leroy Jenkins, um, you hold Richard Abrams, and uh, Noel Da Costa, and Orson Cunningham, and all of these people, you know, we actually started that way, then we went, we moved into the women and that is when we played in the streets of New York. I mean, we played Joan Tower, for example, and, 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 and the women that actually we uh, thought that the people should know because the composers would come. And we went to Yale, I mean, to uh, hospitals, churches, gyms. I mean, we were everywhere. In the parks, Prospect Park, you saw, and that was Noel, uh, you know, Noel Pointer which, I mean, unfortunately, he died. And um, we did all kinds of things. We did, um, also then we got into the Latino thing. And uh, we did concerts with Tito Puente, Tito Puente and the, and the Philharmonic. And uh, when Paquito arrived, you know, we did uh, one with Paquito also. Uh, and then, you know, Betty Carter. Uh, you know, we, we did <coughs> all kind of uh, genres of music. But uh, it was actually to introduce the community in New York about all of the living composers. And, um, you know, there was a series down at, at um, one of the, the places on Park Avenue and 42nd Street. And it was totally free to the audience. And, you know, guess what? Who were there? The homeless people. And the homeless people were <laughs> asking questions. And, you know, it was really a, a fantastic era. And uh, I am very moved now that, that Julius Eastman is being paid attention. Because at that time, you know, I mean, he was trying very hard to, to get all the music on the, and, and the acknowledgement of composers. And to, uh, to him, I owe it the fact that he introduced me to Robert Wilson. And, you know, the pictures that you were uh, seeing is the, the opera that I did that Robert Wilson directed. And we were in Europe, and we did it. And it was commissioned by Hans Werner Henze. That also 
gave everybody a, a break, you know, I mean, you know, we did a, a jury and it was David Lamb was there and Tandun was there and all that who reached were there. I mean, you know, I mean, and that was uh, Henze, you know, really, really helping the upcoming, you know, the millennials of that time. Now you're the millennials of this time, you know. <laughs> So, I mean, so, I mean, I talk about history because uh, I am older enough to tell you about all of these things. And uh, if you have a chance to, to team up and work with the mm -hmm. artists that you're actually working with, you know, I mean, these artists that comprise actually also the members of Alain Wilson is very important, you know, I mean, it's like I know Alan from, I mean, since when? I still remember that, you know, when you were actually at the Brooklyn Philharmonic, because it was Brooklyn Philharmonia is the one that we work with. And then it became the Brooklyn Philharmonic, and you were in the post. And we were actually sitting talking about renewing exactly that, uh, that type of thing to, to get, you know, the orchestra to the streets again and, and trying to entice people. Uh, uh, yeah, yes? I hear it. making music in the conservatory, but also making music in the street. I had a chance to talk to you earlier when you were doing a video interview um, just about that uh, music-infused community. It's coming across in so much of what you're saying. I just wanted to acknowledge that and, uh, and say how much I appreciate it. Um, but something, too, that I'm, I'm Im implicit in what you're saying that I may want to hear talk about, you seem like a grassroots activist. You seem like you had a, a time in your life when you were just making things happen at a grassroots level. Um, am I right? I would love to hear you talk about that. <laughs> and maybe you were just like, this is what you have to do to get things done. I'm just going to do it. Maybe you're that kind of person. Well, I have no idea. I, I don't know. I mean, I grew up and, you know, as, as, as I told you, I mean, I don't have pictures of when I was nine or ten or, or five or four because there was no camera in my home, you see. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we had the same type of food for three or four days. So, I mean, so it's, it's a very different thing. And also a community that if somebody had a little bit of cafe, they say, hey, listen, I have a, you, you have some cafecito? And uh, or somebody did uh, rice and beans uh, or, or, or um, any kind of pastry that was nice. And they knew that, for example, I, I, I remember a neighbor that I would never forget her. Uh, every time that she did that dish, she would have a little big plate of, of for me and knock on the door and said, this is for Tanya. You know, so, I mean, I'm used to that, to, to, to embrace everybody and, and to, I mean, I don't, I don't care about languages or, or looks or, or places, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's only one planet in the middle of the universe and, and, and this is a human race. So that, that's my, my, my thing. But um, the opportunities that, that, that destiny bestowed on me, I mean, I mean, to this day, I'm still in shock. Because, I mean, I met Arthur Mitchell out of a chance encounter, and he changed my life completely, and, uh, and, and gave me the opportunity to meet incredible people, which, by the way, I didn't know that you knew Bill T. Jones. You know we live close to each other? I know. Oh, well, right? yeah. oh and you, you, you know? And sometimes we are in the supermarket. Oh. <laughs> 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 Which, you know, so, but, but, but what do you do when you uh, uh, come from another part of the world? You don't know the language, but there is somebody that actually says, you, come, you know? And then all of a sudden you start meeting these people. I mean, what would you do if you write a piece and the narrator of the piece is Marian Anderson? What do you do? You know, what do you do if you had to learn ballet and the person that coached you is Balanchine? 
if you have to learn a ballet and the person that teaches the ballet is Jerome Robbins. What do you do? And the thing is that what did I do is to ask who these people are. I didn't know who they were. <laughs> I had no clue. I mean, so little by little I was introduced and they, you know, this troupe of people, the dancers, they taught me how to pronounce things, you know. I started learning English at NYU. I mean, I had to look at everybody's mouth because everybody has a different accent. So, I mean, it was, it, you have no idea when you are a foreigner learning another language, you know, it is it's complicated, you see, and Spanish and English don't have anything to do with each other. So that, that is uh, uh, something that I experienced that uh, it, it, it was wonderful. And then my idol, when I arrived, and this, this is the, the closing remarks, okay? I arrived in this country in Miami. I realized that I didn't have anything to do there. The third day, I decided to come to New York. It was a Catholic church because, I mean, in Cuba, you grow up Catholic. You know, the one that gave me a one-way ticket to New York. I arrived in New York. My friends picked me up. They didn't know English. So we all got lost in the, in the airport, at Kennedy Airport, until I heard my, my, my name, Talia Leon, you know, <laughs> and, and, and a policeman came and said, go over there. And then there were my friends. My friends lived in the Bronx, you know? And we took a taxi. And when you entered the Bronx, the first thing what you see, at least for me, it was seeing all those buildings with the stairs on the outside. And you know what happened to me? I said, Maria, oh. Maria, <laughs> Maria. And my friends said, Maria, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> And then I told them, I saw, I saw a clip in Havana about there's a composer that did this song called Maria, and the guy was standing in one of those. <laughs> so now I know him in New York. You know, well the thing is that time would tell. 1977, I was taken at Tanglewood, and who was my teacher? Leonard Bernstein. And I told him the story, and he laughed like you have no idea. <laughs> but but that, 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 that is how I arrived here. And uh, as I said, that, you know, I'm still in shock about what has happened. And all the people that made that possible, they are not here. They are my ancestors, but they walk with me. And, you know, we, we have that. You know, I carry them with me, and, and, uh, and that's why I would like to, you know, they look different, they didn't care. My, my, my Chinese ancestor, he's the one that bought me a piano when I was five years old. They were in a hurry to make me happen. You know, I mean, you don't buy a, a kid a, a, a second-hand piano. And he paid, it was eight pesos a month. I always remember. But anyway, that's it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.